Welcome to Public Health America, a weekly program produced by BronxNet in partnership with Mercy College. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. Here on Public Health America, we speak with experts from an array of specialties across the liberal arts and health professions to provide you with not only the best science, but practical tips to live a healthier life. We also celebrate what studies have long documented, namely the unparalleled value of a liberal arts college education by setting the stage to pursue a career of your choice, increase lifetime earnings, and engage in civil debate. Our experts will share decisions they made and support they received that helped them to beat the odds. By sharing one or two life lessons, their stories may provide you with the inspiration and method to realize your dreams. This is Public Health America. Welcome to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. It's my pleasure and privilege to have with us today Dr. Patrick McCauley, Associate Professor of Religious Studies and Philosophy at Chestnut Hill College in Chestnut Hill, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Patrick, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this to some for some time. Pleasure. So, Patrick, you've been working on a new book that's going to be coming out very soon on Immanuel Kant's third critique. Tell us a little bit about that book and the work you're doing. All right. So Immanuel Kant wrote three major works, the first, the second, and the third critique. Uh, the first one had to do with the nature of experience. How do human beings experience reality? The second book was mostly about ethics. How do people make decisions uh, in their lives relative to morality? And the third book, which gets the least amount of attention, is about uh, art and about feeling the, the emotional responses to art and to landscapes. And in particular, what I focus on is a, a section of the book called the sublime, the analytic of the sublime. You may have heard this term, but it's kind of an old fashioned term. What it really means is the mind blowing experience, right? So he spent some time talking about how human beings digest some of the most powerful and profound moments of their life. like the birth of a child or getting accepted into that college that is just beyond your reach or uh, having someone agree to marry you or somebody crucial to you has died. And these overwhelming experiences have an effect on the human mind uh, that's unlike any other experience. And so I've been working on a detailed analysis of how that process works. That's fascinating. Um... I mean, certainly when I think about um, a mind blowing experience, it definitely makes me think of art. It makes me think of music in terms of just the emotional response to something that just resonates with you. Um, so let's do a bit of a, a, a deeper dive. Uh, obviously, when you're looking at one of the greatest philosophers uh, thought to be of, 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 uh, of recorded history, what are some of the what are some of the primary ideas, thoughts, or premises that Kant is starting with when trying to make sense of the sublime? Okay, so if you think about regular life, right, we encounter objects of a certain size. Um, you see behind me, there's a, a van or a model of a van, the one that I had when I was in college. And our mind, in the first critique, Kant talked about how our brain processes things that are of a certain size, right? So I can pick this up or I can pick this up and, you know, here's a ruler. And because they're limited in size, our brain has an easy time grasping them, getting an understanding of them. Um, and so we go through our regular lives looking at books or desks or coffee cups. And because they're only of a certain size, our brain can wrap itself around these ideas fairly easily. What Kant gets into in the anal analytic of the sublime is the idea that sometimes we get exposed to things that do not have boundaries. They are too, they are so important that how, like if my, when my ch first child was born, the importance of it was so big that I couldn't wrap my brain around it. 
Um, you may find that you're at the Grand Canyon and you're looking at the Grand Canyon and it's so huge that your brain struggles to come to grips with what is before it. Uh, many people have had the experience of looking up at the night sky and coming to a profound understanding that it goes on forever. And these stars are so large that it makes everything about me small. And when I get to that level, an experience of something so big and so beyond me, that it begins to reshape the architecture through which I think about things. And in particular, what it does is it forces me to understand how little small things are relative to the very large things. Fair enough. That's a great uh, description of a, you know, admittedly a complex uh, concept. So let me ask this. So does Kant talk at all about the frequent, and if these are the wrong questions, I, 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 I hope you'll tell me. Does he talk about the frequency with which these sorts of events happen and or in the reorganization of, I'll use my word, one's cognition or experience of the world? So you have a birth of a child. Uh, it completely changes your consciousness. Perhaps you have some sort of uh, religious or spiritual experience related to it or otherwise. And that changes your consciousness. Does Kant talk about what that change is or what it represents? I'm so glad you asked it. I was going to bring it up if you didn't. So where this project came from, uh, back in 2018, I was applying uh, for a sabbatical. And I, in order to do a sabbatical, you have to have a project. And the project um, was I wanted to write a book about uh, a, 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 a circumstance that was happening in publishing uh, having to do with um, uh, uh, young adult literature. You, you may have seen the Harry Potter series. You may have seen the Hunger Games. Um, you may have seen the, uh, the His Dark Material series. This has become a major element of any bookstore is the young adult literature series. And and in this, in this genre, the most interesting thing to me, uh, as I started really delving into it, is how many of the authors were female authors and how often the protagonist was a female protagonist. And as a student of literature, anybody who's even done a, a little bit of, of, of research into the nature of adventure literature, it's usually a boy or a young man who is the main character, the protagonist of the story. But in this new genre that was emerging over the last 20 years, you had these young female protagonists, these young female heroes. So the audience reading these books were female, the authors writing the books were female, and the characters, uh, the main character was female. And this was a massive shift. So as I got, I started to really want to, I, I proposed writing a book about that. But at the center of a book about strong female protagonists in young adults literature is this idea of the fundamental value of the individual human being, right? The, the core moral idea, the core ethical idea of coming to a recognition of authentic human individuality as a core and base baseline principle. So I went to go write that book and I came up against the fact that over the past 40, 50 years, there's been a movement away from thinking about people as authentic individuals uh, and postmodernism sees things as you are a product of your con your context, right? Your, your socioeconomic context, your gender context, your racial context, your, uh, you know, all these different ways form and shape you into the person you are. You're not who you are by yourself. You are who you are based on your context. I didn't want to go in that direction. I wanted to work with the idea of human beings are in and of themselves unique and precious individuals in and of themselves at the authentic level. So I needed a tool to be able to make that case. And Kant, Immanuel Kant argues in his second critique about the fact that we are human beings who bear the responsibility of free will. We make our own decisions and we feel the responsibility of our own decisions. And so I went to go use that material, but for 200 years, there have been people criticizing it. And then I found a secret trap door in the third critique in the experience of the sublime. In this, the mind-blowing experience, like seeing the night sky and seeing its, its immensity or looking at your child and feeling the immensity of that meaning, you don't have to know Kant's philosophy 
to know how it's affected you. And so I was able to find a way to argue for Immanuel Kant's authentic individuality without the person who's experiencing it understanding anything about Kant's philosophy. It was a way to get to that idea without using the philosophy itself to get to that idea. That idea. Sure. I mean, fascinating stuff and so important to reflect on it. What it makes me think of, Patrick, is uh, so years ago, Dr. Maxine Green at Teachers College in New York wrote a book called The Dialectic of Freedom. Mm. And in it, um, she her primary thesis was that freedom, whilst is uh, something that is uniquely human, that it is not something that you just get automatically. It's something that you have to work for. It's something that you, I'm not going to say earn because that's the wrong inflection, but that another, it's not simply don't take it for granted, but that it, it, to, to have true freedom takes true effort. Yeah. And, and, and I, I think, and, and I haven't read Kant in years, but and, and when I did, I'm sure I didn't understand it, but I, I'm just saying, bear the responsibility of free will. Yeah. That sounds like that to me. That, well, that's that, exactly it. That's exactly it. So what, what he's saying in the third critique is that that freedom and responsibility and morality is part of the human progress over time, that human beings aren't born with a conscious, self-evident understanding of their own possession of free will. It's discovered over time as one goes through the process of maturing. And the argument I'm making in this book is that for some people, the sublime experience throws you into such a different perspective that you begin to become aware that you are capable of making decisions on your own sense of free will, even if in the moment before you had never even thought of such a thing, right? And so the idea of staring at that child, you know, an example of this is uh, when my when my uh, first child, Christian, was born, um, I, I, had, I turned 40 the week that Christian was born. But as I stood there in front of the glass looking into my child uh, sitting there in the incubator, um, this young man came, was standing next to me, came over, and he was one of these, uh, one, uh, he was so fascinating. He, he had uh, leather jackets filled with chains and boots with spikes, and his hair was pink and sticking straight up, and he had piercings, um, and he walked over 16 or 17 years old, and he stood right next to me looking into that window and saw his baby wheeled in. So there he was 16 or 17. I'm standing there and I'm 40. And he, his jaw drops as he looks at his daughter for the first time. And he just stares unblinkingly at this child. And then after a couple of minutes, he looks over at me and he looks back at his child and he looks over at me and he looks back at his child. And then he looks at himself. He looks down at his own leather jacket and, and he starts to laugh. And I say, what? And he goes, huh, well, I guess it's not about me anymore. I think it's all about her. Right. And he, you could see that this dawning awareness of his responsibility and his willingness to be dedicated to the needs and uh, of this young child, this, this infant just overtook him quite by surprise. But in that moment, he realized that what overtook him was his in chargeness of his own decision making. I can be the person who can be that that baby's dad and I think I'm going to do it. A lovely story of uh, taking one's responsibility for one's own freedom. We're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, uh, Dr. Patrick McCauley is gonna talk about his undergraduate experience and how that informed his ability and made possible uh, his career. This is Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. 
So Patrick, in this part of the segment, I always open with the same question, which is tell us where you were born and what were some of your formative experiences? So I was born in Belfont, Pennsylvania, which is uh, right off the campus of uh, Penn State main campus. My father was a, a PhD candidate there at the time. And so my first three years were on the Penn State campus. My dad likes to say I was born on campus and I've never left. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, I grew up in the Massachusetts, right outside of uh, Boston. Um, and uh, it's, it's, not, it's not the usual story of a person who ends up getting a PhD in philosophy and religious studies. So when I was um, younger, uh, I, I, had, I had two, two or three issues that were pressing. And one uh, was I, uh, mild, mildly dyslexic. I can read at about seven, eight, nine, maybe 10 pages an hour, even to this day. Um, I read very, very slowly uh, because it takes that much time for me to process what I'm seeing. At the same time, I had um, uh, very serious, very serious problems with regards to my feet and my lungs. I had uh, corrective shoes and uh, severe asthma. And um, you know, being dyslexic, I would often reverse things uh, in math. And so, by the time I got to middle school, uh, I was nobody's pick for anything great about anything. Um, I was not good at social social situations. I was not good on the sports field. I was not uh, any good in uh, the classroom. Um, but uh, in my freshman year in high school, where I was dead set in the middle of anything, I wasn't bad, but I wasn't great. I had this one teacher, Ms. Lind, who approached me near the end of the, my freshman year and asked me if I would be interested in taking the exam for the advanced placement literature and English track. And I literally turned around to see if she was talking to somebody else because I was the last kid anyone would expect for something like that to happen. And I asked her about, I said, look, Miss Linda, you can ask the teacher that I've had this year. Uh, I am not the kid you're looking for. You're, you're asking for the best and the brightest. And she looked at me and she said, no, I'm asking you on purpose because I think that you are one of the best and the brightest. And she didn't know me hardly at all. Well, she let me take the exam and I passed the exam. And then she took me aside and said, look, your freshman year has been regular literature. In order to keep up with the students you've just been accepted to, to go to class with, uh, you have to read all the books that they read last year, right? So here are these 14 books. If you can read them over the summer, you'll be welcomed into the AP track. So you can imagine there I was with 72, 72 days in that summer to read 14 books like, you know, A Tale of Two Cities and Heart of Darkness. And, and I'm reading at seven, six, you know, seven, eight, nine, 10 pages an hour. I literally was leading, reading 12 hours a day for the entire summer, seven days a week. And when I got back into class September 1st that year, she goes, so did you read them? And I said, yes, ma'am, I did. And she goes, welcome into the program. And I worked as hard as I could and I was able to keep up much to my own massive surprise. And it came to be, it came to be clear to me after a while that particularly when I got into philosophy and existential literature, the fact that I had dyslexia, the fact that I read so slowly became my superpower because everyone else that I was competing with, particularly in grad school, could read like 70, 80 pages an hour. So they're going through Immanuel Kant and they're going through Kierkegaard and Heidegger and their brain is trying to absorb all that at 80 pages an hour. I get to absorb it at eight pages an hour. So the more difficult the material, the stronger the advantage I had because I read. So think of it like some people drive through a town, walk, you know, they drive through a town in a car and they can pick up some of the details as they drive through this town. I walk through the town. I see 10 times as many things as you see because I'm walking through the middle of town while you're driving through it. And so the very thing that people told me when I was in high school was going to keep me back and be the reason why I didn't belong in, in college became the very strength that allowed me to really succeed at college. Again, such a lovely story. Uh, uh, and, you know, I, it, it, that attention to de detail and uh, a willingness or a, not only a willingness, a, 
a uh, necessity of, of close attention. There is something uh, that sounds a little Dickensian about that, or right. the tale of two cities. I will also say, Patrick, that it, it does seem uh, clear in a very positive way that a critical moment in that uh, narrative is, is when a teacher, you know, exercised great belief in you and challenged you to uh, to really, you know, bring your studies to another level. And then you did that and uh, and, and things went from there. Um, talk a little bit about uh, where you landed uh, to do your undergraduate studies. Uh, what went into that decision and uh, and how did your first year go? So by the time I became the student I was to become later and started to really emerge as somebody with some ability, the, the first thing that showed up is that I was very, very good at physics and chemistry and mathematics. And uh, that wasn't surprising. My father was a ceramics uh, engineer and world authority. And so nobody was surprised when those were the skills that emerged as my top, my, my, the things that I should focus on and all, all the uh, achievement tests suggested that so that I went to engineering school for the first two years. And I worked really, really hard to try to become uh, an engineer of ceramics. Um, and I did all the labs and I took all the, the, the classes and I, I did all the, the calculus and, the further I got into it, the further I started to dedicate myself to understanding the the requirements of being able to handle myself in an engineering context, the more I started to wonder whether or not I really belonged in it, uh, or to be more accurate, how much was it worth it to me to get this good at a career that was becoming more and more clear, not something that I was fascinated. I liked, I was fascinated with science and physics and but I, I only liked it I, I was only fascinated i was not crazy in love with it and the worst part about it was even at engineering school i was double doing a double major with literature and man did i every single minute of every single day in every single literature class i took i just wish they were twice as long um and i just no matter how long how serious the book was I couldn't wait to get out of class and back into the book to find out what was going on there. It was like a pile of gold and I could have as much of it as I wanted. And by the time I became a sophomore, I began to really wonder whether or not I was really suitable for an engineering science uh, life when I was so crazy in love with, you know, existential literature and the like, you know, reading Dostoevsky and, and this. And, and I made a hard choice that required me uh, risking having my father l see me as someone who betrayed him. Uh, but I, I said, you know what? I think I belong in film school. So I transferred from my engineering school to Ithaca College, where they have one of the country's most renowned film programs. And man, I it didn't take any willpower at all to immerse myself into a double major in literature and film with a minor in philosophy and religious studies because every single bit of it was just so it just drew me in so hard and so significantly and every single minute I sat there in this like, feeling of gratitude because it was so meaningful and fulfilling to be immersed in this when I knew what it was like to be immersed in something that I didn't care about as much and I didn't take any of it for granted. And that drew me through undergraduate school into graduate school. And I've never lost that feeling of gratitude and fulfillment as I drew, as, as I go through the process, because I really found what I wanted to, to fight for and strive for in those books. And it, it's not surprising to me that Ms. Lynn could see that all the way back when I was 14. Yeah, that's great. I mean, what you're saying resonates with me personally. I was an undergrad English psychology major, and my experience of English as a major, which I felt was my primary major, uh, was very similar to yours. Um, it's also very clear from, again, your narrative, which just comes across so nicely and clearly, is just the significance of finding 
what you actually love to do and that you went on this journey and you were doing great. Engineering is a great career and you were good at it, but it's not where your heart was. And you made the bold decision to, uh, to follow that. And uh, clearly that was the right decision. Um, with uh, a little, and, and, and in fairness, you know, the whole thing about, you know, parental uh, acceptance, which we, you know, all want, uh, that's significant too. I mean, there's almost, uh, since we're literature, there's something, you know, Shakespearean about that, that dynamic, um, but that you still knew what you needed to do and what you wanted to do, and so you followed that. Um, we have just a little bit of time left. Uh, we have a fair number of, um, you know, younger viewers in our audience. If there was something that may or may not be thinking about attending college, uh, may or may not be thinking that college is for them, uh, what would your guidance be to someone who's on the fence? Well, it's, it's going to be a, 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 a both end kind of reaction. So. When I was an undergraduate, I, I mentioned that my father was not pleased when I left engineering school for film school, which he saw as art school and the very opposite of science. Um, he, he let it be known that if I was going to be going to college, I was going to have to pay my way myself. And uh, by that time, I had developed um, with a friend of mine from the track team in high school, my own, my own uh, contract painting company. And uh, we worked really, really hard. We got a lot of we got a lot of very good help from from some from neighbors, and uh, we were able to be very successful at our painting company. And both of us were able to make the money we needed to pay for college. And so I have a very strong and deep respect for those who find their calling in a blue collar job or a contractor job. I found a lot of fulfillment in it, and it was a very very serious form formative part of my basic my entire character and structure. Uh, however, I was also going to college at the time. And um, one of the things that I think is hard to see when you're not yet at college is that college is the place that has been designed to allow you to try a little bit of this and try a little bit of that and maybe go to this presentation, uh, hang out with a few friends who are taking this major. It's not just about getting a degree in psychology or in literature. It's about the context that is designed and built to help you really seriously explore your own authentic nature and come to an answer to the question of where I really belong and what, what serious and significant contribution I will be able to have, to, I can offer the world something of profound significance if I just give myself the chance to find out what it might be. And if you give yourself a chance in college, you may find it does just that. What an undergraduate experience can do to advance your career and your authentic self. This is Public Health America. Thank you. I want to thank our viewers for tuning in. I want to thank Dr. Patrick McCauley of Chestnut Hill College in Chestnut Hill, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is Public Health America. I'm your host, Dr. William Latimer. See you next time. Until then, take care.